for your peace and your grace. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is here with us now. God, I thank you for all of our members, those who are here and those who are traveling. Father, uh, please keep, uh, again, we ask that you would keep uh, Larry and his family safe. And now also, Father, as uh, Josh and his family are traveling, keep them safe. And Father, as we look forward to uh, Vacation Bible School in a couple of weeks, we just ask that your heart and your spirit would already be preparing the hearts of children and of parents, and that you would help us to get everything set here, that an environment is created where children can come and freely learn of you, and they're free to hear from you and free to respond to you. Thank you so much for loving us and hearing us and for forgiving us for all of our many sins. It's in your awesome name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, night, um, you know, I don't get to have my brother around a whole lot, and you all know that, so it's, it's awesome to have him here. And I've asked him to sing a couple of songs um, before uh, the sermon tonight, and then we're going to do a couple with you. Uh, this, this first one, Shalom, uh, is real interesting when I first heard it, I was just like, man, that's just such a simple thing. He just keeps saying shalom over and over again. Um, and some of you know that this is the word for like hello and goodbye in Hebrew, uh, but it's really got a lot deeper meaning. It it means peace, but like completeness, like be complete, be at peace. There's also... Uh, an idea in the in the it's almost like a compound word where there is basically the price has been paid so the price has been paid for you to have complete peace there's all this kind of neat rich imagery that the hebrew people would have known when they were meeting each other and when they're wishing each other shalom they're wishing each other the best that life has to offer in god shalom i want you to be complete i want you to be at peace I want you to know that God is taking care of everything. And so that's kind of this this word. And then this song, uh, I don't know what inspired you to write it, but it's beautiful and I love it. So studying that word in the seminary, uh, true, it's very uh, focused on trying to impact the community at Waco and to impact the world. Um, very concerned about uh, issues of justice, and um, and so it's not easy to help uh, homeless people. It was hard over the years, um, but uh, that was one of the things that came to my mind um, was uh, that that word shalom was not just a word about uh, political. Um, or, or, you know, um, military peace, but it was a, a, a sense of, of fullness and well-being, and that, um, and so, the, and then, then, then I came back to that thought of Christ Himself being our peace, as it says in Ephesians chapter two, um, and other places. So, um, He Himself is our peace, and we, as, as Paul writes in Second Corinthians, are the ministers of reconciliation, and so this this thought of peace was. These simple lyrics is really just a prayer. So.
shalom. You said you won't leave us alone. Shalom. You said you won't leave us alone. Shalom. next one is uh, Everlasting Love. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jeremiah 31 and follow along. There's several verses that are I have drawn you in. 
Channel 7, I think. Can we get that back in the monitor in the house? You'll have to turn it on toward you. Flip the switch. And touch, tap it so it knows where it is. There we go. Yes. We'll invite you guys to sing along with us here a little bit. And the, uh, this coming up out, we're going to deviate a little bit. But you'll know what we're doing. Don't be afraid. And we'll come back to, to where everyone is happy and comfortable. So then you start by E. E. F is the whole thing in E.
It, so uh, let's see if we can really, really get a thirty-minute sermon <laughs> today. Would you pray with me one more time, Heavenly Father. Um, we do ask that you would have it our praise. We know that you are. We know you're here not because of some magic words we've spoken or some great passionate feelings we've had toward you. You're here because you keep your word. You're here because you promise where two or three are gathered, you are there in their midst. And we're gathered here tonight for your glory. Open our hearts and our minds that we may better understand your word and, and who you are and, and what you're about in our life. We love you, Jesus, and speak to us now, we humbly ask. Amen. In Mark chapter 9, there's a, a familiar story where Jesus is coming down off the Mount of Transfiguration and there's an argument going on. And uh, I, this probably isn't how Jesus felt, but I, I can feel the frustration. You know how you've just done something marvelous, how you've just done something spectacular, and then everyone else is doing something petty and worthless, and you're just like, don't you get it? And this is one of those moments, and I don't, I don't believe that Jesus had those emotions. I'm just saying I feel that when I read this. I feel frustrated for Christ. I feel frustrated because he's talked about his death. He's talked about his resurrection. He has transfigured himself and shown his glory to his disciples. It's one of the most intimate moments in Scripture. And he walks down, and there's this ridiculous argument going on. Let's look at this. And when they came to the disciples, so remember he had taken three up. Peter, James, and John had seen this. And they're coming back down the mountain and the other disciples are there. So they came to the other disciples. They saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him and asked him, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out. And they were not able. And he, speaking of Jesus, answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground, and he rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. 
But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. There's, there's more in this patch is here tonight than we could possibly get through. But I do want to focus on the actions of the dad because I think they're really significant in giving us uh, some great insights on what a godly dad does. I want to notice you to notice that he brought his son, he was bringing him to Jesus, he was bringing him to the disciples. This is significant. Godly parents bring their children to places where Christ is being preached and taught and sung about and honored. Godly dads bring their children to church. They take them to Christian events, to outreach, to ministry. Godly dads bring their kids to places where there are disciples of Jesus. And, and this, uh, this mixing of people is kind of interesting here to me because you've got just kind of normal people, you've got scribes, and you've got disciples. The disciples, these are the real Jesus followers, right? The scribes, they're just like lawyers. They're real legalistic about what the Torah, what, what all that says. And then you've just got the average Joe who's just kind of, what's going on here? It sounds a lot like church to me. It just does. You come to church and you know there's people there. There's people there that love Jesus and that follow Him with all their heart and they are passionate about following Christ. And then there's some people you kind of wonder about because they just seem nothing is ever good enough for them and they're always upset about something, right? They're always nitpicking at something. And then there's those people that just kind of walk in they're like, what's going on here, right? So this is very much like church to me. It just looks a lot like what, what our kind of construct of church looks today. But the dad knows where to bring him. You, you bring him to the disciples. You bring him to church. You bring him to these places because eventually he's going to meet Jesus. So that's, that's the first simple point I, I just want to make is that godly dads take their sons and daughters to church and to godly places. The second thing I want you to see is here in um, in verse 18. I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Guess what? I don't have the power to change your life. And you don't have the power to change someone else's life. A lot of people come to church and they think that somehow we're going to use magic on them and make them better people and make them godly people and make them Christians. But I can't transform your life. I can't, really can't do much more than be a witness of what God has done in my life. And so, this isn't letting us off the hook as believers that there's nothing for us to do because there are some very important things for us to do. But changing lives is the sole realm of God. It's the miracle that we still see today. We don't really see lepers being cleansed and the dead being raised, but a changed life is the evidence that the Holy Spirit has come into somebody. There's a, there's a young man I'll talk about a little bit, and he won't mind, he wouldn't mind if he was here, who is playing percussion this morning. Two years ago, he didn't know Jesus. Two years ago, he was a different person. The friends and the family that are with him today, 
are still making comments to him about, you're not the same kid I knew five or ten years ago. He's so radically different. Jesus did that. And those people, those lost people, they can't figure out, they think he's got some kind of a legalistic religion, they can't figure it out because they know deep down inside that they can't change themselves. They know that that kind of change only happens when something radical happens to you and they just associate it with some kind of, of, of radical new way of thinking instead of the very power of God has come in and transformed his life and translated him from darkness to light. So it's important. Godly dads also need to know when it comes to our children, We cannot save them. And this father had tried, and for how many years since this boy was a child? Don't get disconnected from the emotion here. You're taking your boy, and a demon has been torturing his soul and throwing him into the water and into the fire to try to kill him. And he was on top of that, The boy was mute and deaf. He can't even hear the comforting words of his father. He can't speak and cry out for help. He is utterly helpless. And he is, without a doubt, an amazing symbol of the lost soul apart from Christ. Mute, deaf, and tortured by the enemy. And the dad can't save him. And he's at his wit's end. So he brings him to church, if you will. The church can't help. In fact, this is what gets Jesus upset. And it's not the fact that they can't help. It's the fact that they're trying to, in their own power. They thought, that what are they arguing over? The right way to cast out a demon. They don't even see the situation here. This father has also been tortured for years. This child has been tortured for years. We need compassion here. And at the very least, to ask the question, how long has this been going on? To bring the father into a human conversation Jesus is always so conversational with us. He's always asking us the penetrating question. He wants to get to our heart, and that's how He wants us to minister. He wants us to ask the questions that bring people in and that let them know that we care. That was, a, that was an I care about you question. Jesus is omniscient. He knows how long this has been going on. This is an I care about you question. And this is something fathers do. This is a little off to the side, but fathers ask, I care about you questions. Godly fathers do. There's four points to this, so just because I'm getting to the third one, don't think we're quite done. I want you to see here that the godly dad gave him into the hands of Christ. That's what godly dads do. We pray and we take our children and we say, here, Jesus. Here. You know what to do. You know how to fix it. You know how to make it better. Godly dads bring their kids to Jesus. Over and over again. Every day and every night on their knees. In their, in their conversation with them as they ask them those questions. How are you doing When we go to church and we go to eat pizza, we bring our kids to Jesus. And this is important because Jesus' command is bring Him to me. Why in the world are you arguing about this? You can't do anything about it anyway. It is absolute, that word perverse, It's insolent. You insolent generation. You're constantly thinking you can do things you can't do. I have created the universe and part of the Red Sea 
and walked on water and changed water into wine and raised countless from the dead and cured countless lepers and you're still trying to do things by yourself. I just want to take a moment here, church. Those disciples should have said, one moment, sir, Jesus will be right here. Can we get anything for you? Can we pray for you? Can we talk with you? Jesus will be here and Jesus will take care of this. The disciples were as insolent as the rest of them. Believing that somehow they had something to offer this child. The greatest thing we can offer him is Christ. And his compassion. Again, when they asked, how come we couldn't cast this out? He said to them, this cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Because prayer talks to God. Because God's the only one that can change this life. So a, a godly dad recognizes the authority and the power of God in his life and in his family's life and relies on that. There's one other thing happening, and this is happening in the background. This is always happening in the background. And so many times we don't see it. We don't understand. Because we're so human. And we're so caught up in how we think we know how to do things. God forgive me. But if you go with me for a minute to the chapter of first, I'm sorry, the book of first John. Chapter three. Verse one. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. What manner of love. I love that King James. Behold what manner. This is a great love. Godly dads love their kids. They, they love them enough as Josh was saying, to know when you have to let the consequences fall. And they love them enough to know when you've got to pick them up screaming and writhing and take them to Christ. They love them enough to continue to seek the face of the Father to bring their children up. Because of the Father's great love to us. And His love is Jesus Christ. See, we're bringing them to love. We're always bringing them to love. God is love. And His love expressed to us is Jesus. Jesus on the cross. So, godly fathers, bring your kids to church. Bring them to prayer meetings. Bring them to Bible meetings. Bring them to Jesus in your conversation, in your prayer life. Trust in His power alone. And understand that this is all an expression of of the love of the Father, the fact that we are even given the blessing of children is a gift of love from the Father. To know His love, to share His love, and to express His love. Let's pray. Father, what manner of love have You showed us that You have called us children of God? And Father, all of us who have received You into our hearts, we are Your children. Not that we've earned it, not that we deserve it, but it's what you have given to us in Christ. Thank you for that. Teach us how to be good, good fathers, good mothers. Teach us, God, how to not just parent our own children, but to look for those like Paul looked for, the Timothys, that needed a godly dad but didn't have one. So Paul stepped in. And what a great man Timothy became. And Titus was another one of those fathers who just needed a spiritual mentor in his life. Just someone to love him and teach him of you. And Paul stepped in again and what a godly man he became. May we raise up generations of godly men and women as we bring our children to you and as we 
look for those that we can spiritually adopt and raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. We love You, God, and we thank You for answering our prayer and for using us for Your glory. It's in Your great name we pray. Amen.